Thank you for tuning in to this UK Schools Sustainability Network inset video on climate and sustainability. You're in the right place as this is the year for you, your students and whole school community to take serious action. You might think this is more for science and geography teachers or catering and estates managers, but actually this training is intended for absolutely everyone working in or with secondary schools. We decided to put together this short video after staff in our networks were looking for something to share with colleagues but couldn't find anything that covered the main issues in one go. So we thought we would commission some of the most respected figures and organisations alongside teacher and student voices to introduce school staff working in all roles to what we can do about the climate and nature crises. Schools are so important in all of this. This one hour video includes thoughts, ideas and tips from over 30 individuals, including teachers, students and representatives from various organisations from across the UK. Everyone has rallied together to produce this short introduction to the issues, resources, what you can do and who is out there to support you. We hope you will be inspired to join us, whatever stage of the journey you're at in your home or school life, whatever your role or school and wherever you are. Wherever you access this video, you can find resources from our partners and you can find out more about our networks at ukssn.org.uk. See if there's an, any existing network for your school to join or perhaps start up your own as we're stronger together. And you can find a one-stop shop for resources, upcoming events and CPD at Transform Our World, the school's programme from the charity Global Action Plan that hosts our networks. Thank you for watching and enjoy the show. Hi everyone, I'm Henna from the Future Proof Ed campaign and I'm here to talk about how organisations and coalitions can work in partnership with schools to support you with your sustainability goals. Now, we know that climate and nature are important topics and that the task of incorporating them meaningfully into the educational experience is incredibly complex. That's why we've helped to create a coalition of organisations with the deep expertise necessary to support you and your schools on this journey and provide you with the resources that you need for the classroom while we advocate for better support from the government. Now, there are several ways that these organisations can work in partnership with you at schools. Uh, for example, Ashton, which is one of our coalition members, is running a campaign called Let's Go Zero, which brings together schools that are working towards carbon zero by 2030. They have a vibrant network of member institutions and a huge range of tools that cover everything from clean air to using sustainable energy and food provision. If you're looking for lesson plans or new ways to bring climate and nature into the classroom, there are a huge range of resources on offer from organisations such as WWF UK, uh, AIM High, who you'll hear from if you haven't already, and Leading Project. And... If you're interested in the latest international thinking, the OECD are running a great project where they're collaborating with UNESCO and Education International to collect insights from teachers across the globe on what is working for them in their classrooms. We've also been working with the union movement in the form of the NEU and the National Association of Head Teachers to share the campaign and advocate for better support for the transition in schools and colleges across the country. And they've been fantastic so far at sharing the message and supporting schools to be at the front line of the green transformation we need to see. And I can't wait to see what they do next. The climate emergency is going to totally transform the future for children and young people. Work, home, food, transport. Right now, we've got the opportunity to prepare them for this future and it's one we can't afford to waste. There are a whole range of organisations that are here to help and who want to hear what you need to make this a reality. Please, please use their resources, communities and frameworks. And even more importantly, let these organisations know how useful you're finding them and what else you need. We've got a huge task ahead of us, but we're here to support you in every aspect of your journey and excited to take it forward. What do you think of this sound? This sound is called brown noise. What does this sound remind you of? And how does it make you feel? Some people think this sounds like an aeroplane or a car or even an old TV. As our not too distant ancestors evolved, they were attuned to all the sounds in nature 24 seven. 
homing in on the faintest details as they changed. Urban noise pollution now means that we tune out almost everything. We barely even notice the eerie silence of our nature-depleted suburbs at night. Many of us have fallen out of love with the sounds of the natural world, often because we don't get the chance to connect with it like we used to. This so-called brown noise has been carefully designed and engineered to make us feel relaxed. And it's almost exactly the same sound as the ocean. Isn't it bizarre that as we humans rapidly destroy much of nature, we resort to reinventing less good versions of it, when we inevitably discover that healthy, balanced, wild nature is the most important thing in the world. For a moment, I want you to close your eyes and imagine. I want you to imagine how the future could be if we get the next few years right. Picture a future that is so deliciously verdant, so full of life, so healthy and bountiful that everyone would want in. In the words of Rob Hopkins, it all starts with imagination. If we can't imagine a better future, no one will want to get involved. As our friend Sarah Goodenough at the UNFCCC says, we should be selling the brownie, not the recipe. Instead of focusing on how difficult it might be to get there, we need to focus on how fantastic it will be when we do. At AIM High, our mission is to transform global understanding of climate and nature. Of all the times in history, we need people to be learning and wanting to learn. In the words of H.G. Wells, civilization is in a constant race between education and catastrophe. And when it comes to climate and nature, the race has never been tighter. Nowhere else is the gulf between what's known and what needs to be known to safeguard the future of life on Earth such a titanic abyss. This is why schools cannot be more important. Schools shape not only students and their futures, but entire communities. Schools are the fastest way to meaningfully personally reach almost every human on Earth. The world sincerely needs all of you. Facts alone aren't working. Teaching climate syllabus points in geography and science lessons isn't going to be enough alone. To turn this growing emergency around, we need emotions, we need stories, we need everyone at every school to weave climate and nature into everything we do. Whether we're teaching history or keeping everyone well fed in the canteen, we all need to be in this together. So thank you for watching this. We're now gonna show you some stories and ideas and give you a window into what taking an AIM High course is like. So, here's a piece of paper. How many times do you think you can fold a piece of paper in half before it's impossible to keep going? What do you reckon? So the world record is 12 times with a really big piece of very thin paper. Anyway, with a normal sheet of paper, there's a limit because every time you fold it, the thickness doubles, right? And eventually it becomes too thick to bend. Now I know that we can't keep folding this piece of paper in half, but if we could keep doubling its thickness, how many folds would it take until it was as thick as the earth? It would be as thick as the earth in 37 folds. The Milky Way galaxy is so big that it would take over 100,000 years for a text message, so traveling at the speed of light, to reach the other side of it. Now, this is actually Andromeda because it's a bit difficult to photograph the Milky Way these days. Anyway, how many folds do you think it would take before this piece of paper was as thick as the Milky Way? It would be 83. It would only take 103 folds to be as thick as the observable universe. So why on earth is this important when thinking about the climate crisis? It's because we humans aren't wired to intuitively understand how quickly things can grow when they speed themselves up. It's nothing to be ashamed of or embarrassed if you guessed numbers that were wildly wrong before, because it's how we humans naturally think. On top of this, 
We've only really evolved to act quickly when we're faced with immediate threats, like a hungry tiger running at us to snatch the sandwich we're holding or otherwise. We've never evolved to be instinctively scared of problems that investigations tell us are going to be dangerous if they don't feel dangerous now. Unfortunately for all of us though, just like the folding piece of paper, elements of the climate crisis are speeding it all up as it develops. Let's talk about feedback loops. So a feedback loop is a situation where something happening affects the chances of it continuing to happen. Now a good way to explain this to people is to think about eating. So let's give Mr. Creosote a baguette. So when we eat, it makes us want to eat less. And that's called a negative feedback loop because acting on being hungry makes us less hungry. But imagine if eating more made us want to eat more though. That would be a positive feedback loop and it would end badly. Like Mr. Creosote, we would explode. So positive may sound like a good thing, but it's actually bad. Negative feedback loops are all across nature. We get too hot and our bodies try to cool us down. Well, as the world gets hotter due to human activity, the oceans absorb 90% of that extra heat. And other mechanisms try and work to cool the world back down too. But what if the world getting hotter actually started to make the world get even hotter? Imagine if the hotness accelerated the heating even more. Now we haven't had time to cover any of the many simple solutions in our course during this short video, nor a lot of the key ideas, but I want to leave you with this thought. It's easy to think that we can't make a difference as individuals, but our seemingly small actions and communication of knowledge and ideas can be very very powerful. If one person thinks of an idea and shares it with just three people, then stop sharing it. And then the next day, those three people share it to just three more people and then stop sharing it. And so on and so on. How long do you think it would take for the whole world to know the idea? Assuming everyone always tells a new person. It would be just three weeks. It's even faster if each person shares it more than three times. We have agency over our own future, and collectively, we are stronger than any seemingly unchangeable inertia, especially if civilization depends on it. So, do you want to learn everything you need to know about the climate and nature crisis, but don't have much time? Do you want more than doom and gloom? Do you want to know how to be part of the solution? Do you want to go from being a spectator to being a part of the global movement working to turn the crisis around. At AIM High, we've created a range of live online courses for rapidly informing, upskilling and empowering people from all backgrounds and with any level of experience, from climate scientists through to people with no initial knowledge or even skeptics. But most of all, we humanise everything. We make it relevant, meaningful and fun. This is why about 100% of people who start our courses actually finish them. Crucially, we teach everyone how to communicate like a pro, whether you're a science teacher or a cleaner. We show everyone how they can be a part of the story. So join us. The whole world needs you to be a part of this. Thank you. Hello there, my name is Rachel Musson. I am former teacher and now director of education at Thoughtbox. And I'm here today to talk to you about the emotions of climate change, in particular focusing on eco-anxiety. Now this may be a phrase that you've already heard of, it may be something you're experiencing yourself or that you notice in some of the young people that you work with. But whether we like it or not, eco-anxiety is on the rise across the world. Why? Because the climate crisis is a crisis of human emotion. Now, Global Action Plan commissioned a study in 2020, and in this they discovered that one in three young people, according to their teachers, were already exhibiting high levels of climate anxiety. And over 77% of the young people asked said that they felt anxious when thinking about or talking about climate change. Understandably so, this is quite an existential crisis that we're living through. And so as inconvenient as they may be, the emotional responses that we're all having are incredibly important when we're thinking about teaching or talking about climate change in particular in school. Our emotions will change on the roller coaster that we will face moving into the crisis, and we will all be feeling different things at different times. 
Some of us may feel anger at the lack of government action or apathy as we see it. Some of us may feel fearful at the ever-increasing headlines that seem to show the climate crisis growing in extremity. Some of us may feel overwhelm or anxiety at the, at the nations and the people and the communities already being severely hit by the climate crisis. And many may have family, friends or loved ones living at the front line of the climate crisis. So part of our work as teachers is recognising that we will all be feeling very different things at different times and we're all coming into the space from very different contexts and most importantly we are not immune we may be adult we may be teachers but we're not immune from the emotional roller coaster of the climate crisis and so the work starts with facing up to our own emotions and I'm going to just talk to you about three things that we can do starting from today to support our own emotional health in the space and to really help the young people that we're working with move from a space of overwhelm and anxiety to one of empowerment, empowerment and activation. One of the core um, things to recommend, recommend is that the science and the information about why the climate is changing and what is happening around the world important to, to allow young people to understand the what and the why but coupled with that is the feelings and they may be inconvenient as I mentioned but ignoring them is actually to the detriment of all of us. So when we're talking about the climate crisis in particular, eco-anxiety is an important area to focus on. Now, young climate activist Clover Hogan, who talks a lot about eco-anxiety in her own work, recently shared her TED talk in which she said this, Young people have not created this reality. We have inherited it. Yet we're told that we are the last generation with a chance to save the fate of humanity. Now, is it any wonder we have a mental health epidemic and pandemic sweeping across the world in light of the huge responsibility that young people feel is on their shoulders, coupled with the fact that so many young people don't know where to go to for guidance or support and have no safe spaces to be talking about their own thoughts and feelings in this area? Now, eco-anxiety is a term that has been coined in many different ways, but the American Psychological Association have defined it as a heightened mental, physical and or emotional distress in response to changes in the climate. Now, as I said, you may already be exhibiting this yourself or recognise this in the young people that you're working with. But eco-anxiety doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing. And as Caroline Hickman from the Climate Psychology Alliance will say, and I will concur, Eco-anxiety is actually a healthy response to the climate crisis. We're feeling anxious because we care. We care deeply about the health and well-being of the rest of the natural world and the planet that we live on. And so these emotions of high level distress are actually very healthy in response to what we can see happening around us. Now, Caroline, in her work at the Climate Psychology Alliance, supports this change or this shift from looking at anxiety to a space of empathy. So reframing eco-anxiety is eco-empathy. We feel because we care. And when we bring, think about the word empathy, it's an outward facing emotion. And we can channel that emotion to be doing something rather than turning inward and feeling blocked or stuck or apathetic or at a loss of what to do. So let's look at what we can do. Firstly, let's be brave. As teachers, we are not the climate experts. Our role is not to stand up in that classroom and teach the answer to climate change. If we knew that, we would be in a very different place right now. So be kind to yourself and recognise that you're not the expert. Your role is to welcome the questions and the emotions and just allow young people to have a space to talk and to be sharing and learning about the climate crisis. Recognise that we're in this together. We're in the same storm, but in very different boats. Now, the climate crisis is a social justice crisis, and those being particularly badly affected already are often in marginalised areas of our communities already facing many different issues of social justice. So extend our empathy to recognise that many people are facing different complexities of the climate crisis at different times. So step back a little bit, look at the bigger picture before responding to the need to be talking about the emotions because they are there. Let's be safe. Let's create a space to talk about climate change, but create a safe space. Now, when we think about the neuro neurobiology of well-being, we need to recognise that we are, we are not able to separate our thoughts and our feelings. The neurons in our minds interconnect the two. And so we need to think about the core human needs that we all have, whether in the classroom or at home or wherever we are. We need to feel safe to feel heard, to make sense of the world around us and to be understood. And so we can support young people by creating these safe spaces in the classroom for this to happen. 
Now, in the work that Kit Ratley is doing um, in regards to safeguarding, they talk a lot about how climate change is a safeguarding issue and teachers have a responsibility to be safeguarding the futures of our young people. And so let's think about the importance of supporting the mental health and resilience of young people to face up to a complex future by strengthening the core skills that they need to thrive. So let's create the safe spaces to explore these ideas together. And if you're unsure how to do that, Thoughtbox and many other organisations have resources that we can share with you to support. And finally, let's meet connected. Let's move from a space of anxiety by recognising that the climate crisis is a series of interconnected problems. Now, I often hear the idea that the climate crisis is too big or too complex for us to do anything about as an individual. But each of the individual issues affecting the climate are something we can respond to because they each have solutions. So whether that's focusing on plastic pollution or our food choices or our diet or our, our clothing choices or our travel, we can all make small changes which are impacting the whole. Now, I hear a lot of people saying the system is too broken. We cannot do anything. But we are the system. Think about a traffic jam. All of us at some point will have sat in a traffic jam and probably cursed the rest of the cars on the road getting in the way and causing such a jam. But we are the traffic jam. If we were not in that car sitting in that place, the traffic jam wouldn't exist. And it's the same thing with the climate crisis. We are all part of a system. And by changing ourselves, we're changing the system. So focusing on one part impacts the whole and really helps young people to see that they can move from this space of overwhelm, anxiety, channel that emotion into empathy and into action and create wider ripples of change. Now, I'm going to finish with a Margaret Mead quote, which can never be overestimated. She says, never underestimate the power of a small group of committed people to change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that ever has. So I invite you in this space to be brave, to be safe and to be connected and recognise that the emotions are a significant part of the climate crisis and how we teach or talk about it in schools. Now, organisations like Thoughtbox and many of the others involved in this inset are here to support you with lots of resources and guidance and training. So do get in touch if we can help and the very best of luck on your journey ahead in the teaching and the talking about climate change. Thank you. Good morning, this is your outdoor learning zone. In a minute we're going to look at the nature zone. So come and see where your classroom is going to be when you're learning outside. Outdoor classrooms are pretty magical, I think. Definitely something that every school should consider. The way to pitch it is to talk about X space for learning. Um, it just happens to be outside, but it can still be a bookable space. But more to the point, you can explore the natural world or whatever the surrounding environment is more easily and more readily. So you can have lots of short sorties uh, to collect information or materials and come back within one lesson. Many pupils find they can concentrate better and are more relaxed in an outdoor environment. Children with learning difficulties can feel more motivated and inspired. But the best thing about outdoor classroom is that they can be used for any subject matter. This makes it a useful place and platform to talk about environmental education and weave it through every subject. I have a deep love and respect for nature. It makes me want to protect it. Nature is a lived experience. We should feel it, smell it, touch it, see it. Teaching students to value nature means moving outdoors. To create a cultural shift, we need to try something different. Let's move outdoors and make the intangible feel tangible. Running an environmental leadership development program enabled me to weave nature into the fabric of school life. I started off with a tokenistic project, something that wasn't as meaningful. And eventually it became part of our school culture and our way of life. It changed the students' perceptions of themselves and of nature. They had real responsibility with room to fail in a safe environment and it allowed them to learn, to progress and to connect. We made a small start. It grew slowly over the years and connected us to each other, our local care home, the London School's eco-network, community groups, businesses and much more. It changed all our lives. We became more confident and we realised, most importantly, our own power to make a difference.
Hi there, my name is Alex Green and I'm here today from a charity called Ashton and we run the Let's Go Zero Schools campaign. It's a campaign to let any school across the UK show that they want to be zero carbon by 2030. A campaign to let schools show their students, show their families and show their community that they want to be part of the positive solution to the climate challenge we're all facing. We help schools to join together, to be part of a movement, to show their ambition, to show they're taking action now, and also to ask government to support them more, to support them with policy change and with finance and with other areas of support that can really help to make that change to enable all schools to be zero carbon by 2030. So there's lots of ways for you as a school to start taking action to start along your journey to being zero carbon. We think you should really engage with your students and your staff. Let them be part of your workforce. Don't just have small areas of your school that are doing this, really embrace everybody. Get everybody to be part of that movement for change within your school. Understand the work that you're doing already. See where you've got brilliance going on within your own school and see where you can celebrate that. And then look about what you can do next, put an action plan together. You may want to try and choose things that are your quick wins, things you can change quickly and easily that will have an impact. So maybe you want to do meat free Monday for your meals or introduce some bike storage systems for your, for your bikes so people can travel more sustainably. Or maybe you just want to engage in a switch off campaign for, your, for the lights and for the heating or, or just the heating temperatures so that all of your schools can start sort of taking those steps to being more sustainable and get towards net zero carbon. You might also want to make sure that you're looking across your curriculum and how you can change that and things that you can do to incorporate sustainability across that and looking at education for sustainable development being really core in what you do in your teaching and learning. But there's so much support out there for schools and do make the most of it. Sign up to Let's Go Zero and we will help you in every way we can by introducing you to all the brilliant programmes and projects that are out there that can support you to do more. When your school signs up, they're really showing their ambition and we'll connect you in as things grow and develop and as different opportunities come up, we'll really support you as much as we can. And we'll help you to connect into all the different support and help that's there for schools. So sign your school up to, to Let's Go Zero and we really look forward to you joining the movement for change for schools. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paula and I'm from a charity called Energy Sparks. We work with schools across the UK to support them to reduce their carbon footprints by cutting their energy consumption. There's no denying that schools and young people are under a lot of pressure from many different areas. The climate emergency can seem a challenge that's just too enormous to tackle, but there are things that we, that you, can do that will make a huge difference. One of the most effective actions we can take is to reduce our consumption, and nowhere is this more true than when it comes to the energy we use. Reducing energy waste has a significant role to play in cutting our carbon emissions. For schools, it has an added benefit of saving money, freeing up school funds for the things that really make a difference, staff and resources. Energy Sparks puts young people at the very heart of reducing school carbon emissions. Our programmes teach pupils of all ages how to be energy literate and enable them to take the lead on energy efficiency work. Our activities and lesson plans, based around online access to their school's gas and electricity data, give them the opportunity to become energy analysts, communicators and change makers. Our clear data visualisations not only put their energy use in context, but show them the impact that their energy saving actions have on school energy consumption costs and carbon footprints. They develop important life skills, but more importantly are empowered and equipped to continue to make crucial changes in their schools, homes and communities. Your students are at the forefront of the fight against climate change and programmes like Energy Sparks are equipping them to do so. The thought of making a school sustainable can seem an absolutely mammoth task especially considering all of the other pressures that teachers and school staff have on them already. So my maxim is to start small, but to think big. And we've done this at our school in a number of ways, from a series of lessons which had year 10 students writing their own letter to the earth, to then doing the same with all of our key stage three, 
from having our very own Earth Week to coincide with Earth Day of Bramcott. And now we're beginning on the journey of becoming an eco school, having just set up our eco committee and doing an environmental audit of the entire school. And throughout all of this, the thing that I've realised is that it's always not about the um, end result, whether it was the letter to the earth or the lesson itself, but it's about the conversations and discussions that are generated it's the awareness that spreads throughout a school, student to student, student to teacher, student to other members of staff. And it's about that passion and that enthusiasm being communicated to the students and then them communicating it to one another. The curriculum we currently have is about preparing students for the society we currently have the one that's causing the climate breakdown. As with COVID, the position of the National Education Union is to follow the science. And the science shows that we're running out of time fast. So a return to a normal routine in schools as well as in society is, a sleep, is to sleepwalk into disaster. Education International, which represents 386 teacher and education unions in 178 countries, with over 32 million members, is calling for number one, governments to ensure quality climate change education for all. Number two, so that every student can leave education climate literate, equipped with the skills and knowledge needed to tackle climate change, adapt to uncertainties and take part in building a more sustainable future. Three, quality climate change education should be based on science and also address the ethical, cultural, political, social and economic dimensions of climate change. Four, teachers should be trained and supported to provide this quality climate change education. Number five, schools and learning environments should be transformed to support quality climate change education. This is about what we teach and learn how we teach and learn it, what values underpin it. So the NEU calls for the UK government to do all of that in a forthcoming curriculum review, to recognise an emergency situation, which was what we have with climate, requires emergency measures, and to look at it in a holistic way, not just for science and geography, not to hive off climate studies GCSE that only some students will take, and instead to implement Article 12 of the Paris Agreement fully. And that states the parties, the governments, shall cooperate in taking measures as appropriate to enhance climate change education, training, public awareness, public participation, and public access to information. Recognize the importance of these steps with respect to enhancing actions under this agreement. And it's therefore about educating the whole of society, not just our schools, and not just in discrete skills, but awareness of the issue holistically to take part in transformation as active citizens. And this is urgent because at the moment, only 44% of the UK population believe this country has any impact on climate change when it is actually responsible for 7% of total historic greenhouse gas emissions, only 1% less than Africa, Latin America and Asia, including China and India put together. Only 4% of pupils surveyed think they know enough about climate breakdown and 68% want to know more. Only 30% of teachers feel they have received adequate training to teach about the issue with any confidence. These figures show that a level of government failure that betrays our students and puts our future society and our current society at risk. In the meantime, pressing the government to make changes, we have to do whatever we can at whatever level we can. There's a huge amount of work being done by students, teachers, universities and NGOs to produce climate curricula lesson plans, model assemblies, inquiries, some of which can fit into the current national curriculum, but some of which needs to run alongside it and on occasion to supplant it. Between now and uh, the Conference of the Parties, the NEU supports schools signing up to Let's Go Zero, the Big Green Week, 
in September, the climate themed learning month in November. We encourage all our members at all levels to get involved. When I talk to the students in my school and ask them about sustainability or climate change, they can nicely tell me what they've learned in geography or any of the sciences. What they find more difficult is how this relates to their lives. And so if you ask them how we solve the problem of climate change, they'll talk about scientists, they'll talk about politicians. And so that's why I think it's really important that we teach sustainability across the curriculum. We need to make it explicit in economics, in business, in food technology, in design, in engineering, in computer science. We need to show them that actions have consequences, no matter how small those actions are. And we need to show them that we all need to pull together. We need those future economists as well as politicians and scientists. We need filmmakers. We're all part of this problem. We all need to be part of the solution. And we're preparing them for a world that they do not yet understand. I'm sure that lots of you will have plans for big whole school events or whole units of sustainability and environmentalism. And that's really great. But I also worry that that approach takes a lot of time. It allows us to feel that we've ticked a box that we can now forget about. And I worry that it shows our students that these things can be put into a particular space and that we don't need to think about them in the kind of larger big picture of our lives. We don't need to apply them to our day to day existences. And so I like to talk about this idea of green seasoning to sort of sprinkle your teaching with just a little flavour of sustainability and that you might bring into your teaching some kind of reference to environmental impact or that you might uh, think about um, what is the role of nature in this particular teaching unit. So you're taking something that you're already teaching and you're just green seasoning it. You're just giving it a little bit of some consideration of nature. As well as individual contexts and learning for various specific subjects, one of the areas that I've seen sustainability education really successfully develop is in transferable skills for students such as teamwork, research, leadership, working on creative solutions to real life problems, time management, self-reliance, self-motivation and the like. All things that employers repeatedly state as the qualities that they value, sometimes above academic qualifications, in young people looking for work. I've seen this not only in classrooms, but also in the activities undertaken in school eco clubs and societies and the regional and national sustainability networks, in which I've seen students develop genuinely exceptional uh, commitment and maturity, undertaking things like chairing meetings, writing to their MP, lobbying groups and companies, engaging with students from all over the country, devising projects and initiatives to deal with a real life problem that they are genuinely engaged with. These are the sort of skills that will set these young people up for life. Hey, this is Roy Kareem, one of the black and green ambassadors for Bristol. We need diversity, not just in our ecosystems, but in our human systems to produce the most resilient and robust solutions and those the most creative solutions to what are some of the most challenging topics any generation has ever faced. That's why we need multiple perspectives to bring stories that we don't hear about, to bring ideas that bland, normal, non-diverse groups of people might come up with. We need that creative spark that only inclusion and diversity can bring us. My name is Maxwell Ayamba, uh, founder and project coordinator of the Sheffield Environmental Movement. I'm here to talk about the need for teachers to develop educational tools that will help to promote um, learning among young people from all diverse ethnic minority backgrounds. And I'm saying this in line with the fact that in June 2012, the UN Conference on Sustainable Development, known as the Rio Plus 20, produced a document titled The Future We Want. This document is tied in with the 16th principle of the F Charter. All teachers need to adopt the F Charter as an integrated and interdisciplinary approach to teaching. This will enable students and people as future custodians of the environment to learn about how to apply the principle of the F Charter as a sustainable framework towards a just and peaceful world. Teachers, by designing a curriculum that incorporates the principles of the F Charter, would be empowering people and students to pursue positive changes in their lives and develop a sense of global responsibility. This would allow them to come to terms with the challenging the challenging issues facing the Earth's ecosystems, 
which are vital for life sustenance. They would embrace the diversity and environmental justice um, issues that are quite important for young people as future custodians to understand the world they live in. Teachers therefore need to develop environmental educational toolkit, toolkits that can be used to make the F Charter relevant and accessible to students and peoples of all ages and diverse ethnic minority backgrounds. The two, these tools and kits and other resources for teachers themselves should include lesson plans built around the principle of the F Charter. It is essential that this information should include the history, mission, goals, strategy, and focus of the F Charter. By so doing, teachers will be educating a generation of young people who will pursue a more just and sustainable, peaceful world, taking into account individual, their individual lifestyles, such as their carbon footprints in terms of the climate crisis that is currently facing the world. There is the need, therefore, for teachers to understand the importance of outdoor learning as part of the curriculum and to ensure that this is taken into consideration when dealing with students and peoples. Thank you. The climate crisis is an educational priority with all young people to be taught about its ecological and social impact. As educators, we can map out a curriculum to be taught, not just in science, but cross-curricular, including horticulture. All lessons should have elements of outdoor learning. Outdoor learning creates an inclusive school. It is vital for young people to stress the importance of learning about the environment and to develop a culture of caring for it. Our education system needs to have an effective accountability mechanism to prepare young people to respond to, adapt to, and mitigate against further climate change. All our learners must have the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, and this can be achieved when everything is embedded into the curriculum and with appropriate training provided for the teachers. We must create an all-inclusive environment and sustainable education settings to provide learning experiences for children and young people. An important point is raised. Are there strategies in place to promote equality and diversity in our classrooms? We must set clear rules regarding how people should be treated challenge any negative attitudes, create an all-inclusive culture for everyone, use resources with multicultural themes, plan lessons that reflect the diversity of the classrooms, make sure that learning materials do not discriminate against anyone and are adapted where necessary, for example, assistive technology for auditory processing disorder for the hard of hearing. Finally, a quote from Irfan Daleri, a social change consultant. He said, the time has come for systemic and structural change, and it is up to each of us to engage as wholeheartedly as we can with whatever life force we have. So we're here at the Tatton Show with the RHS, showing our children's garden. The sustainable development goals are embedded right the way across the curriculum at St Vincent's. And yes, all about growing our veg, gifting it to communities, making soup for the park runs. Yes, all about rewilding the school grounds. But the sustainable development goals that reflect the where's the employment opportunities for visually impaired young people in climate action. What you'll see in Reclaim the Green, Reclaim the Nature, of the limitless imagination of visually impaired young people who are creating ideas for climate action. That's what this garden represents and reflects. Climate action, creativity, and new concepts and innovation that can save the planet. To be completely honest, until last year, I had no idea about anything environment related.
but it was really in my English lessons with my teacher who constantly reminded us of the issue and that I had to research it. I couldn't be learning about this this world that we live in where human activity has such detrimental consequences and not feel like I couldn't do anything about it. Like it was very much a thing where this subject I was learning perpetuated um, this idea in my mind that I needed to do something to fix this. A lot of like my passion for environmental change comes from um, being pretty passionate about like poverty relief because um, obviously it's always like the most vulnerable, poorest people that are hit hardest by um, like the act, like the real life uh, impacts of climate change. And I think um, coming coming from that kind of standpoint, rather than more of like a let's like, just help animals and things like that, which um, a lot of like you know, like the aforementioned criticism that, like, eco-warriors get. Um, coming from a slightly more human perspective um, kind of means that um, I think it's a, it's a bit more appealing and when you... You can also uh, paint it as a bit more of, like, a compassionate movement um, where, like, you're not just trying to help, like, you know, like, like cute dogs and stuff. You're actually trying to, like, save people. And lots of the people get yeah, quite a bit of anxiety, especially seeing kind of the reluctance and complete failure by our government and those people in power to actually do something. And that makes you, like, on a personal level, feel like you should be more responsible, take action. I think that's something that encouraged me. And, you know, you see a whole uh, contingent of animals, like, dying because the heat is too high or, you know, flash floods or something like that. It does really, um, you know, make you really sad. But I think doing like doing concrete actions is one of the best ways to make yourself feel better um, because then you can actually see how you're making a difference and it does really help. One of the things I respect most in people, and this isn't just talking about climate change, this is a holistic thing, is when they take actions that they, they will never gain any benefit from. And something that really epitomizes that is when people, older people in the older generation, who might never be affected by climate change should still do all they can to prevent it. Um, I founded the Environmental Society at my school and it kind of was just myself and another student at my school who were kind of the driving factor on this and we kind of have been throughout. I kind of feel like a mountain to, to, try, to kind of try and get people involved and try and convince people that this is important but I think once we started to get going and kind of launched it we realized that much more students than we realized really care about this issue and I think there is kind of like a rising consensus amongst like youth that this is a really really key issue and that we really need to do something about this and kind of joining these networks and kind of not just on a regional level but on a UK level and hearing all these speakers it kind of it really makes you feel like you're not alone and uh, there's people who kind of share this drive share this concern for something that is probably one of in my opinion the most important issue of our generation and for generations to come and I think that I completely agree with Advait in that the people in power aren't doing enough and that is part of the thing that makes it feel like such an uphill battle because you somehow end up doubting yourself when you shouldn't because when you're not getting that support you're like you're thinking is this something that I should be passionate about when clearly it is. Well I certainly hope that things will have changed by then. I think um, one of the main things is that everyone knows about climate change now and whereas maybe you know 10-15 years ago people saying and you had people on tv saying this is a hoax um scientists coming out and saying you shouldn't believe in this and um thankfully everyone basically agrees now that climate change is real and we need to do uh things we need to take steps to combat it and i think one of the most kind of inspiring things is seeing how many young people are, are involved um we're all here we're all students yet we've taken it upon ourselves to take you know give our time to improving the planet and um i i definitely think things will change uh, in the next sort of the next few years and when our generation comes into power and i do hope that it will be enough because um unfortunately we've left it too late um to sort of fully prevent the damage that uh, 
that has been caused and that will be caused over the next sort of 10, 20 years. But that's not to say we we can't prevent like massive loss of life, both human life and uh, the extinction of uh, like sort of millions of animals and endangered species that will be completely wiped out. They won't exist anymore. And I think that's, for me, that's something that's really, really humbling and really scary too, that um, these sort of animals, they literally won't exist in a few years um, unless we we take action. And it's it's no one's fault, but we all, as sort of humans and as people who have the opportunity to take action, I feel like we have a responsibility too. Dear Rajath, it is me from 2050. A lot has changed since 2021. Some for the better, some for the worse. Climate change still remains a prevalent issue in today's society. I look back on the time you are living in with fondness. We still talk about and reminisce the bizarre chaos of the 2020 period. Well done for making it through. It did slowly but surely come to an end. I know you dream of being an architect, building green oasis in urban cities, so never forget why. Never get sidetracked by the fast innovation of technology and the rush of building the best buildings in the city. I'd like to know if you and those around you still feel a sense of moral obligation to protect the environment. Or are you beginning to feel pessimistic about it all? You're shocked. You knew the way everyone treated this planet was bad, but you never thought it'd be this bad, did you? The air is hot and heavy now. Pollution is so bad you can't even take a breath outside. Massive corporations continue to stake their place in the world of politics and, subsequently, the environment. They continue to mass-produce. Fast fashion is still prevalent. The new Heathrow runway was erected and continues to launch and receive plane after plane after plane. And the atrocities the world has witnessed since your time can be difficult to process. But... We've learned one thing from all this. It's that life finds a way to go on. And it did. All I will say is be open to change. You might not like it, but it is an inevitable part of life. And we must evolve and adapt to account for it. and I'm from St. Vincent's and today I'll be showing you our garden. So here we have our Grow Your Own. And even this sign here with the black dots is says Grow Your Own in Braille. Over here we have our wildflowers. In our school we have a wildflower, we have two wildflower beds. Over here is a bug hotel for the, bug, for the um, bugs to live in. Um, over here is our sunflowers with our marigolds. Over here is our reclaim bit. We've used old broken brailers that aren't in use anymore to plant our plants inside them. We want every school to have a governor and member of SLT with sustainability in their remit. We want every school to have a sustainability lead who is given the time and allowance for the role. We want every school to be signed up for the Let's Go Zero 2030 schools campaign. We want every school to have a garden or outside classroom space. We want every school to make sure sustainability is integrated into the curriculum so that every student learns about it throughout their learning. Hi, uh, my name is Jim Knight. I'm a member of the House of Lords and I'm part of the Future Proofed team. And I really hope that you've enjoyed this brief introduction into what you can do for sustainability in schools. And now, of course, it's over to you. It's up to you now to get on with taking some of these things, to accessing some of the resources. There's some great stuff from WWF UK, for example, from the Eden Project. Uh, there's more than enough 
um, from all the various people that you've heard from uh, today to support you in, in what you can do. There's CPD available. You've heard from AIM High today. They do really uh, inspiring uh, professional development for, for teachers and others. Um, there are sharing spaces. OECD, for example, have a place for people to share what they're doing over video uh, of each other teaching and, and what the practice looks like. So there's plenty around you. And I really hope that you uh, enjoyed hearing from Alex from Let's Go Zero with that idea that we can get our schools to pledge to be carbon zero by 2030. And just think of the learning that we can do around the young people leading those sorts of projects. The projects around, yes, what the estate can do, but what the travel plans turn from the school could look like. What, what it would look like if our food was uh, more sustainable and thinking about the sourcing of the food that's consumed on the premises. And then what can we capture? What carbon can we capture in school? How do we measure the uh, the impact that we're having? How do we measure the air quality? How, how do we see that change? There are so many things that we can be doing with young people, giving them a sense of empowerment, giving them a sense of agency around this really important subject for them and for us around climate change and sustainability. So it's really exciting, the opportunity that we can have attached to this. I really look forward to hearing more from you around what you've been able to do as a result of getting closer to nature. Here I am in sunny Orkney, um, feeling that nature connectedness and using that to improve our well-being and to inspire us around taking the action in our schools to give our young people a more sustainable future. Thank you very much.